Hutton um, study that we've done recently, uh, looking at on wafer measurements in the 140 to 220 uh, gigahertz uh, band. Um, just before I get into the, the presentation, just like to thank my co-authors, um, so uh, Xiao Bang Shang and uh, Nick Riddler uh, from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, and then also uh, Roger Lozar from uh, Fraunhofer uh, Institute in Germany, and uh, Thorsten Probst and uh, Uwe Raas, uh, from uh, PTB uh, in Germany uh, as well. So just a quick outline of uh, the presentation. Um, to give you a little bit of background to the uh, intercomparison uh, motivation and uh, give you some details of the, uh, the intercomparison, how we conducted and uh, specified the intercomparison, and then uh, look at some results and some observations from those results, and uh, then uh, one or two concluding remarks um, uh, as a by way of a summary. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the outline of, uh, of, the, uh, of the talk. So a little bit of background as to, uh, as to why this, this work is deemed to be uh, worthwhile and important. So the motivation, of course, increasing um, applications of millimeter wave devices um, above 100 gigahertz, and uh, many uh, different um, applications are, of course, uh, becoming uh, prevalent now in terms of uh, um, I imaging and uh, ultra-wideband uh, communications, that sort of thing. So there's increasing interest in this, uh, in this frequency range. And on wafer metrology, of course, forms a significant um, element of the uh, design cycle, um, yield testing, and of course, uh, extraction of, uh, of equivalent circuit models and that sort of thing. And um, at the moment, of course, uh, as uh, many of you are aware, that traceability is not yet fully established. There's lots of work going on to establish traceability in this region. And so, uh, as a consequence of that, knowledge of repeatability and uh, measurement reproducibility uh, really are the key elements of contributing to measurement confidence in this, in this frequency range and for this type of measurement. So we conducted this work as part of the Planar Cal research program, which has been mentioned already this afternoon. And uh, this, uh, this intercomparison formed part of that uh, research program uh, led by, uh, by Uwe Raas, uh, from uh, PTB. So a bit more background, just to just be clear about the terminology um, that, we're, that we're using this afternoon. In terms of repeatability, we're talking about factors such as probe placement accuracy and um, condition of probes and the contact damage on the, on the devices that are being, uh, being contacted. Whereas uh, for reproducibility, we're talking about a much broader range of factors, of course, and things like the choice of probes and uh, the probe pitch, uh, and the probe pad parasitics, which will, be, uh, which will be a key variable. And then, uh, very importantly, the choice of whether to conduct an on-wafer or an off-wafer calibration. Uh, using an impedance standard substrate, then an off-wafer calibration is implicit. Um, but, of course, there is much uh, to be considered in terms of the relative merits of on-wafer and off-wafer calibration um, for measurements in this frequency range. And then, of course, crucially as well, the ability to define a consistent uh, reference plane and uh, reference impedance for the measurements. So all of these things contribute to the reproducibility of the, of the measurements. So just one thing to, to mention as well by way of introduction, the, the, um, some of you may remember that a couple of years ago presented some work of a, an interlaboratory comparison. So this was uh, work conducted within a single laboratory. And uh, the aim of that work really was just to try and uh, get a, a proper feel for the relative contribution of repeatability uh, compared with some of these other uh, factors which you might uh, better classify as reproducibility factors. So in, in effect, we were simulating a reproducibility study within one single laboratory and uh, uh, trying to extract the relative contributions. And the key finding of that work was that the, the typical standard deviations from repeat contacts was much smaller than, uh, than uh, would be uh, obtained due to the other systematic uh, differences. And um, this was despite the, uh, the obvious contact damage to the, uh, the devices being probed. And um, you can see on the, the SEM micrograph there uh, some considerable damage. And yet we found actually that the, the standard deviation from repeat contacts was relatively small compared to things like different probes being used, different calibration techniques, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this, this, um, um, th this, this uh, factor, this, this relative contribution um, has influenced the way we specified the, uh, the intercomparison because we've decided to make this comparison um, uh, not really look at repeatability as such, uh, to take that out of the comparison and to look purely at the reproducibility factors. So the aim of what we were trying to do was to conduct a, essentially a round-robin uh, intercomparison 
of uh, on wafer measurements in this, in this frequency range. And the, the key philosophy was to ask the participating laboratories to use their normal approach to conducting the measurements. So we didn't specify a calibration method. We didn't specify um, any of the sort of uh, usual factors that you might, uh, might associate with making the measurements, such as the, the probe pitch, for example. That wasn't part of the specification. The, the laboratory was asked to use their normal approach to, uh, to conducting these measurements. And um, the aim of this work as well is not really to, to compare analytically the different methods. There's been lots and lots of work over many years comparing calibration techniques, of course, and that wasn't really what we were trying to do here. We wanted to find out what the impact was of simply asking uh, well-respected laboratories to uh, conduct these measurements and, and then for us to, to look at the variability of the current state of the art, if you like, in terms of making these kinds of measurements. So um, respected laboratories were asked to participate and, uh, and to then allow us to document that variability uh, for the measurements. And uh, we make this, this reproducibility study essentially consistent with the, the, the philosophy of reproducibility studies that are um, uh, described in the International Standards Organization document, which uh, many of you would be familiar with. Um, so participating laboratories, there were three labs participated in this, uh, in this experiment. So the Fraunhofer Institute uh, in Germany and uh, PTB in Germany. Um, I, I wouldn't attempt to pronounce um, PTB's full name, uh, not with Uwe in the, in the audience, but uh, we just refer to them as PTB. And then the NPL, National Physical Laboratory in the UK, um, participated in the experiment as well. So three laboratories that are, are known to, to, to most of us, and uh, we were considered to be uh, respected labs in this, uh, in this field. So for the intercomparison, we decided to circulate two impedance standards, uh, uh, substrate standards, uh, commercially available impedance substrate standards and to, uh, um, to select the DUTs from those devices. So, of course, these uh, impedance uh, standard substrates contain all of the usual things of flush and uh, offset uh, opens and shorts, uh, loads, uh, match loads and mismatch loads, and, of course, the selection of coplanar waveguide lines. So they, they, they provide a variety of devices that we can use for, uh, for comparison. So in order to make... The, uh, the DUT, a consistent device for the comparison. All the participants were asked to use um, an absorber uh, beneath the, uh, beneath the uh, impedance standard substrates. Uh, so a standard uh, cascade microtape part was used to do that to reduce unwanted modes. Uh, we were mindful that some participants may have um, a metallic chuck and some may have a ceramic chuck, for example, on the uh, probe station and the presence of an absorber was intended to make the, uh, the DUT a more consistent device. Um, we also specified, of course, that none of the devices that we'd selected for the comparison should be used in the calibration, but uh, any other structures on the uh, standard substrates could be used for calibration. So that allowed the possibility of on-wafer or off-wafer calibration as the, uh, uh, as the participants chose. So in line with the, uh, uh, the general philosophy of reproducibility, um, uh, experiments. We asked the participants to, to state the, the measurement platform and the particular uh, calibration method they used. So the first participant had a VNA uh, key site, um, VNA and VDI extenders, and used 75 micron uh, pitch probes, ground signal ground probes, which were cascade uh, probes, and they used a TRL off wafer calibration for all of the, the measurements. So they didn't use either of the, the two circulated. Uh, impedance standard substrates. They used their own uh, impedance standard substrate and did a TRL calibration. Uh, participant two used uh, Rodian Schwartz um, equipment, uh, VNA and extender heads, and they, uh, they also used 75 micrometer uh, ground signal ground probes, so a GGB um, product, and they opted for a multi-line TRL um, on wafer calibration, so they used um, other, other artifacts on the two DUT uh, substrates that were circulated, so effectively doing an on-wafer calibration for all of the measurements. And then the third participants, again, used key site uh, VNA and VDI extenders, but they used uh, GGB Industries probes, so not exactly the same as participant one. And they opted for an, a short open load through calibration, or salt calibration, on-wafer using one of the uh, DUT substrates. So in effect, some of their measurements were on-wafer and some of them were off-wafer. So typical measurement setups, of course, um, using uh, metallic uh, chucks for two of the participants, participant one, participant three, 
Um, they had a metallic chuck. Participant two used uh, ceramic chuck. There's no image of their setup, um, so their, their uh, arrangement was, was slightly different in that respect, but otherwise a uh, fairly conventional setup with waveguide connectorized uh, probes. And then for the um, experimental conditions, the, uh, you'll notice that all of the participants opted for 75 micrometer pitch probes, uh, which was a, a wise choice. Um, given the frequency range in mind, at the top end of that band at 220 gigahertz, the pitch of these probes is approaching about 0.1 of the guided wavelength, so pretty much at the limit of usability for, uh, for this frequency range. The, the labs were asked to make a single measurement. We already decided not to ask them to make repeat measurements, and of course that helped to make sure that the DUT remained a consistent device as we passed it from laboratory to laboratory. Uh, so we, we'd, we'd removed uh, the need for doing repeatability measurements. So a single measurement of each device and using uh, equally spaced frequency points, 100 megahertz apart. And we did specify as well or suggest that they should use uh, an IF bandwidth of 100 hertz so we get a consistent um, dynamic range. So the, the first participant was asked to remeasure the devices once they'd been uh, measured by all participants to check that no uh, statistically significant deterioration had occurred and uh, none had occurred. Um, so I haven't included graphs of the repeat measurements from the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the first participants, but there was nothing statistically significant noticed there. So the, the, the DUT devices survived well as they were passed around to the participants, and, um, and that, uh, that gave us confidence that the reproducibility uh, study was, uh, was useful. So the test devices that we selected, actually we, we had a, a quite a range of devices, and I've, I've chosen a representative selection um, which, which give typical results. So uh, in terms of one port DUTs, we picked um, an offset open circuit. Uh, we picked a 100 ohm uh, mismatch termination and a flush short circuit as, uh, as devices to, uh, to act as DUTs for the, uh, the study. And then we, uh, we also had a number of, um, uh, of two port devices and I selected again a representative device, a 250 micron um, CPW line, a 50 ohm uh, CPW line uh, from the uh, from the two the two substrates that we passed around, so let's have a look at some results uh, from the uh, uh, from the participants, and uh, we'll start with the, uh, the the 50 micron offset open circuit, and uh, you'll notice that um, um, one of the participants had some what could be considered non-physical behaviour, um, a reflection uh, magnitude linear reflection magnitude well above unity, and um, essentially, as I say, non-physical non um, behavior evidence. Uh, so participant one, uh, just to remind you, elected to do an off-wafer cal for all of these measurements. And um, there was also some, uh, some ripple evidence in participant three. Participant three had done a, a, a salt cal, and so there's a little bit of ripple evidence there, um, which may or may not be attributable to the, the salt cal that, uh, that was used. If we look at the, uh, the phase, the reflection phase for the offset uh, open circuit, so I've, I've put a, a dash line on the graph there for the, the nominal phase. Um, there's probably about 20 degrees of variation across all the participants um, for the, uh, the phase. Um, the nominal phase was just estimated from the, um, the manufacturer's data for the velocity factor, but of course uh, the actual phase is strongly dependent on the, the probe placement for an offset device, uh, and, and so, uh, so we would expect some variation um, for, the, for the phase results. Uh, for the 100 ohm mismatch termination, um, the nominal reflection magnitude, again, is indicated there on the, uh, on, the, on the graph. So participants uh, two and three produced results that were broadly consistent, I think we can say. Um, there seem to be some, some evident differences from participant one, again, as I say, the off-wafer TRL calibration um, was used by participant one, but some quite different results um, for the, uh, the 100 ohm mismatched termination. And then the flush short circuit, the other one port device that we, uh, we asked participants to, to measure. Um, again, there's some non-physical results evident for the, uh, the off wafer calibration. Um, Although uh, for the other results, uh, for participant two, there seems to be some indication of some, some loss element there, uh, even though we're measuring out of a flush short circuit. Um, it's not entirely clear uh, as to why that is. Um, so quite a variation um, between the participants there in terms of linear 
uh, reflection magnitude. And then if we look at the reflection phase for the flush short circuit, um, again, probably of the order of 20 or so degrees of variation between the participants. Um, we would expect some deviation from the ideal phase, of course, for the flush short circuit with a parasitic inductance. And um, the, the probe pad uh, parasitics are unlikely to be fully corrected in this, this situation, so we'd expect some, some variation in terms of phase uh, for those uh, results too. Um, looking at the, the two-port device, the 250 micrometer uh, CPW line, a 50 ohm CPW line, uh, some quite interesting results here. The participant that elected to use an SOLT calibration shows quite a considerable ripple and um, a lack of reciprocity in the measurements. Um, again, the um, participant that did an off-wafer calibration showed quite a, a, a different uh, result there, um, possibly uh, not capturing the uh, transmission tracking error term um, as well in the, uh, in the calibration. Um, and then the transmission phase, again, the nominal phase, I've included on the graph there in the, the dashed line, but uh, we would expect some, some variation in the, in the phase measurements. It's uh, uh, probing a, a CPW line of this sort is highly sensitive to the probe placement, and uh, the probe over travel will make quite a significant difference to the probe length. So that nominal phase is, um, is, is perhaps slightly questionable in that sense, so, and we'd certainly expect some variation. Um, over the phase. So again, about 20 degrees or so of, uh, of phase report differences uh, reported there. So if we look at those, those results in terms of the standard deviations, I, I appreciate there's only three participants, um, but nevertheless, if we look at that, that data uh, in terms of the standard deviations for the high reflecting devices, and look at the worst case of the standard deviations, we can see um, that the, uh, across the, the sort of Subbands, if you like, within the uh, 140 to 220 uh, range. Uh, figures approaching around um, 0.08 uh, is, is, is typical. And um, if we then consider that in terms of the reproducibility, so with a 95% confidence between any two participants likely to, to do this kind of measurement, we end up with um, figures of around about 0.2 in terms of uh, linear uh, magnitude, which seems quite uh, disappointingly high uh, for this kind of measurement. Um, for the transmission, if we look at the, the standard deviations uh, amongst the transmission measurements, we fare a little bit better, although at the, the top end, the, the, uh, the top 20 gigahertz or so there, we're approaching the same sort of figures as the, uh, uh, the one-port reflections, the high reflections. Um, again, the reproducibility uh, limits there for two participants. Uh, if we use an expanded uh, reproducibility limit, we're looking at the top end of a similar sort of figure, around about 0.2. We fare a little bit better at the bottom end of that range. So I, I said earlier that we conducted an earlier study looking at the, uh, the, the standard deviations for contact repeatability, and you can now see why we, we've not uh, included those in this study. We don't see the need to have uh, um, uh, included those into this reproducibility figure. Well, of course, we could do so in the, in the standard way, but it's unlikely to change the final result very much. These are about an order of 10 uh, less in terms of the uh, standard deviations compared to the, the reproducibility figures that we've attained here. So just one other thing I want to show you as part of this, this uh, collection of results. So one of the participants has provided some uncertainty estimates. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the sort of thick green um, outline here. Um, and these, of course, these uncertainty estimates are only valid for the calibration and for the approach taken by this particular laboratory. But it's interesting to see how far apart the, uh, the other measurement results are from the uh, expanded 95% confidence boundary of, uh, of one participant. And there's quite some difference between the, the measurements and, uh, and those, uh, th those confidence intervals. Um, the situation is slightly better for the transmission measurements. So again, this, this, um, this, this outer line of the thick green band is the 95% uh, confidence boundary submitted by one participant, and so valid only for that particular calibration. But again, we see um, some considerable differences in places uh, going outside of that band, um, that, that, that range of, uh, uh, of confidence interval. So in summary, um, the implied reproducibility limit, and again, I say we're only three participants in this experiment, 
but it's, uh, it's still quite large, 0.2 in linear reflection transmission. And uh, this can't be attributed to contact repeatability. This is due to differences in approach in, in undertaking these measurements. That is essentially the message here. And so as a consequence, we can see that the variation between laboratories is typically larger than the expanded uncertainty estimate provided by an individual laboratory. And uh, this suggests the need for some caution in um, interpreting measurement results, even when provided by well-respected laboratories uh, with a lot of experience in this, in this field. Um, it would seem a fairly obvious statement to make, perhaps, um, in, a, in, a, in a meeting like this, but off-wafer calibration is generally problematic above 100 gigahertz. I think that's been uh, well understood, and so yeah, good reproducibility is likely to mandate on-wafer calibration um, as normal practice. And then finally, just one other point to make, that a, a larger interlaboratory comparison would certainly be interesting and worthwhile doing. Um, and I think that would be uh, uh, a worthwhile uh, sort of future project to involve many more laboratories in, uh, in, in, uh, in a study a bit, uh, a bit like this one too, um, to, to, to investigate further what the, uh, the current state of the art is in terms of such reproducibility limits. So just an acknowledgement as I finish um, from the... Uh, uh, EMPR-funded uh, project, Plain Arcal, which has been mentioned uh, already this afternoon. Uh, this, this work was part of that, that research project. Great, thank you. <laughs> it's the end of the afternoon. Everyone is asleep. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Question? Yes. 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 And I, unfortunately, I can't answer that. Um, so the, the participants submitted those results without any um, enhancements, without any smoothing, obviously. We would not want them to do that. Um, so I don't know what the origin of those spikes were. Those spikes were noted, but I don't know what the origin was. Um, we'd have to ask the, the participant in question what, what the, the reason is, if they have a, 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 an explanation for those, those, those spikes. Yeah, as I say, I don't know, potentially something inherent in the hardware that they were using, I, I assume, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>